Welcome, everybody, to the Target Marketing of Junk Foods to Communities of Color webinar. We're very excited to have you join us today. We have two fabulous speakers. I think we're going to have a fabulous discussion. My name is Lori Dorfman. I'm the director of the Berkeley Media Studies Group, part of the Public Health Institute. And we're hosting today's webinar on behalf of CICHE, Communities Creating Healthy Environments, a national program of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that is led by Makani Temba Nixon and the staff of the Praxis Project. And Makani will be joining us later at the end of the webinar to say a few words, I believe. Right now, I'm going to introduce our speakers so we can get right to the topic. Before that, I'm going to tell you that if you have technical difficulties during this session, you can dial one 229 3239 and get assistance. That You should be seeing that number right now. If you have a question at all during the session and need technical support, please ask your question. And our trusty guide through the webinar process, Heather Gellert of BMSG, will answer your question. So you can ask her that. Also, during the presentations, we're hoping you will have um, be inspired. I think you'll be inspired when you see them, but also be able to ask questions as well. So be sure to type your question in the Q&A box. We will be collecting those questions, and then we have set aside about 20 minutes at the end of the webinar to have a, com a robust conversation about all of this information. We will call on you, and then you can ask your question online. And if we have some technical difficulty, I'll um, read the questions. So be sure to say your name, uh, type in your name when you uh, pose your question as well. So I'll repeat the technical assi assistance number one more time, one 866 229 3239. Call if you have any problems. Feel free to type in the Q&A box questions for our speakers and questions for Heather if you are having technical difficulties. And if you just joined us, I'm Lori Dorfman from the Berkeley Media Studies Group, project of the Public Health Institute. And we're so happy to be hosting this webinar on behalf of CCHA, Communities Creating Healthy Environments, a national program of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation led by Makani Temba Nixon and the staff at the Praxis Project. We have two fabulous speakers today, Sonia Greer and Kwesi Harris, and I'm going to introduce them both to you, and then they're going to show you some slides, and we're going to talk about target marketing, both from, from two perspectives, really, from what we know from the research, and then what we know from what you can do about it. And each of our speakers are experts in these areas, and I'm just so pleased that they could join us today. Sonia Greer, our first speaker, is an associate professor in the Department of Marketing at the Kogood School of Business at the American University in Washington, D.C. She has been studying race in the marketplace and what interests me the most, the social impact of commercial marketing, and has um, joined with BMSG and others on studies of digital marketing in particular that we're very excited about. She's a member of the African American Childhood Obesity Research Network, and she has in the past also worked with the Federal Trade Commission. So she understands not just the research side of this and not only conducts research, but really understands the policy implications of this as well. And I'm going to invite her to start in just a minute. First, though, I also want to introduce uh, Kwesi, who, uh, Kwesi Harris, who has been an, an activist on this issue a long time. He's a public health advocate. He calls himself a servant leader because he's training young people to take control of the environments in which they live. He's been doing this in uh, Chicago and other places. His latest lecture series is called Hip to the Game, Getting Addicted, Manipulated, and Eliminated, and the Elements of Cool, K-O-O-L, Killing Off Our Leaders both of which prepare young people and community leaders to tackle the predatory, predatory marketing that they see and the promotional tactics. And he's done a lot of this work in the area of alcohol and tobacco, is now um, thinking about how that applies to food marketing. I'm really excited to have Kwesi with us. When I was talking to him before, he, he told me a washing machine doesn't work without an agitator, and, and he's the agitator helping, to get thing, helping us get things clean. So between Sonia and Kwesi, I think we're going to have a really robust discussion Sonia, I'm going to invite you to go ahead and start, and then um, 
I just want to remind everybody, as you have questions, when either Sonia or Kwesi is speaking, type them in, and we will um, get to them in our Q&A session. Thanks. It's all yours, Sonia. Thank you, Lori, and thank you all for joining us today. As Lori mentioned, I'm going to talk about targeted food and beverage marketing to black consumers. I'm going to talk more generally about uh, black and Hispanic consumers because a lot of the challenges and issues and the process that I talk about is really the same. What I'm going to try to do is first give some context very quickly on the obesity epidemic, then talk about why focus on target marketing, then I'm going to go through in a little detail the process of targeted marketing and give some examples, and then I'll talk, give a summary of the academic research and end with some complexities to consider. And I'm going to do all of that in the next 15 minutes. So if I start talking too fast, someone just tell me to slow down a little bit. Um, in terms of obesity, most of you are probably here because of the obesity epidemic, but if you look at this chart, you can see uh, quickly that the highest rates of obesity uh, tend to be among, in this case, um, black girls and Hispanic boys, but the rates among ethnic minorities tend to be higher than they are among white children. This is also true among adults. So this epidemic, as we look at different types of solutions, the contextual variable of target marketing is one of them. So when you think about why focus on target marketing, marketing is at core a system designed to affect consumption. It helps to structure consumer choice. It affects the awareness, availability, and attitudes about food and beverage um, products. And for, in that way, it influences consumer choice. The targeted marketing environment may also hinder or limit the effect of general initiatives. And if you look at the picture here, you can see this, you know, social marketing intervention of don't take childhood obesity lightly with my kind of shopping spree, you know, going out and which one looks more attractive. Don't thinking about childhood obesity are going to get some um, attractive looking food. So that's what we're up against and what we're thinking about. When you talk about black consumers and marketing, and this could say black and Hispanic consumers and marketing easily, they're attractive targets for, uh, for marketers. These are the fastest growing segments, and they're also viewed as trendsetters. So using them um, at, within marketing and marketing to them has these spillover effects that will bring in other consumers. The food marketing may also be synergistic with other audience characteristics. And by that I mean, for example, media use patterns. So when you look at media usage by ethnicity among youth, you can see that while white youth tend to spend eight hours a day with youth, black and Hispa with, with uh, media, black and Hispanic youth spend almost 13 hours with media. So that's four more hours per day with media, and media is how marketing is in fact transmitted. There's also um, heavier consumer orientation. I mentioned the trend setting. There's also um, people, uh, black and Hispanic youth, as well as adult consumers, tend to be more favorable towards marketing than other groups. And there's some research going on why, but there's, there's more research needed to understand that process. And I'm going to talk about response a little later as well. So I want to go through now and define marketing and talk about the target marketing process so everyone understands how it works and why it works. Marketing, there was a new definition created in 2008 which talks about it as the activity set of institutions and processes for creating, communicating, delivering, and exchanging offerings that have value for customers, clients, partners, and society at large. Implicit in this definition is the notion of exchange. Exchange says people do things out of their own self-interest. So people are going to try to optimize their own value by doing what gives them the greatest benefit for the lowest cost. And marketing practices are designed to create perceptions of value among consumers to try to prompt exchange, in this case, product purchase. In terms of the target marketing process, it's really one of segmentation, targeting, and positioning. They call it STP in marketing. This is the basis whereby different consumer segments may be exposed to different food and beverage products, prices, and promotions. 
since it's infeasible to address consumer preferences on an individual basis all the time, though that's happening as well, marketing companies segment populations into subgroups of people who share characteristics. These characteristics may be based on different variables such as race or ethnicity, but also gender or usage behavior where you go light versus heavy users of a product, say people who frequently go to fast food restaurants or other types of variables that may be relevant to the product. After the audiences have been segmented, a company will decide to target their efforts on one or more segments based on their specific goals, such as increasing product usage or shortening purchase cycle um, so that people might buy more more often. Then they position the product to appeal to these target segments. And this includes specific actions related to what's known as the marketing mix or the four P's. And that's the price, the product, the promotion, and the place. And place refers to distribution in this case. And I'm going to give you some examples of each of these in a minute. But I first want to talk about the backbone, because the backbone of the marketing strategy process is consumer research. And consumer research is used to establish goals and objectives, to segment the market, to figure out how to target the market, and to figure out the best way to position the product to the target market. So it often involves an in-depth analysis of attitudes, beliefs, values, and behavior of specific consumers. And there's a large, diverse research industry focused specifically on multicultural consumers. There's an industry focused specifically on African Americans, one focused specifically on uh, Hispanic Americans, as well as on Asian Americans. And the population growth and increased buying power of these groups lead marketers to want to understand them at a um, higher level. So going back to my point about the four P's, this is what a targeted marketing strategy looks like once it's implemented. The product is going to be the types of food and beverages that people see, the packaging, the portion sizes. The distribution will be the places that people can buy it, the food outlets, what's in or not in the neighborhood, the types of foods that are available in those outlets. The price strategy would involve the actual prices, the relative prices, as well as what it might cost to access those products. And the promotion strategy would involve advertising, sales promotion, sampling, sponsorships, cross promotions, things that happen online, things that happen on the mobile phone. Um, so there's a variety of things way beyond advertising that marketers will use in order to promote their products. The psychology of target marketing um, is based on this notion that uh, black and Hispanic consumers who tend to be distinctive uh, in society by virtue of being a minority are going to notice um, more easily, more frequently, uh, promotions that are directed towards them or products that are even directed and customized towards them. When they notice this similarity, um, they tend to identify with the person who's promoting it as well as with the products. And that identification leads to persuasion, which will lead people to buy the product uh, that they see, or at least think favorably of it, and then they may see some subsequent marketing that leads them to buy the product. So here's an example. Uh, 365 Black is an initiative that's by McDonald's that started out as a one-year initiative um, several years ago, and it's still going on. And it started out with, this is a picture from the website that features the Baobab tree. They had radio and TV ads featuring Venus and Serena. Tom Joyner, um, who has, I think it's more than almost 150 million listeners weekly, um, highlights these little-known black history facts. And he talks about McDonald's sponsoring these little-known black history facts. They also had posters in stores. They had a Black Music Month celebration, a raffle of a Kenyan vacation. And they also distributed booklets about black history to youth through a school program that was sponsored by McDonald's and Coca-Cola. So this is an example 
of a integrated marketing targeted campaign. And the use of the ethnic cues in the campaign, such as the African American celebrities, African cultural symbols, the support of cultural institutions, and ethnic media, such as black radio, will increase the similarity and identification with the messages and evoke um, these favorable responses. Soft drink target marketing is, is another area um, that's of importance to obesity, and this information is listed in a brief that you may find interesting on the African American Collaborative Obesity Research Network website, which is acorn.org. And it talks about sugar-sweetened beverage consumption and the impact on black Americans' health. Uh, consumption of sweetened beverages such as soft drinks contribute to weight gain, obesity, diabetes, dental decay, and other health issues. And heavy target marketing of soft drinks to African Americans um, is something that's been going on since the 1930s. And research suggests that African Americans are targeted disproportionately to whites. So here's an example of a targeted effort that's a, uh, based on a partnership between the local boys and girls clubs with the Coca-Cola company. And it involves a, a concert tour of Lupe Fiasco, who's a, a sort of an eclectic, eclectic hip-hop artist. And tickets could only be, um, only be won through partnering radio stations, partnering uh, retailers, and Coca-Cola street teams, which where you might see a van that goes into a neighborhood and hands out product samples, as well as tickets to a particular event. We all know that fast food marketing also is something that's heavy in the black and Hispanic communities, and this quote from uh, the McDonald's vice president for U.S. research shows that they acknowledge that they know this is targeted towards lower income and ethnic consumers. Digital marketing is uh, something that's also on the rise. This is a screenshot from Reese's Puff cereal website. There was a, a study done on cereal marketing, and this was rated as one of the least nutritional um, or most unhealthy cereals in that study. And this was also the only one that was found that was targeted specifically to African Americans. And on this website, you can uh, create a mix, or you could listen to this multicultural but predominantly African American young band sing and rap about the Reese's Puff cereal and what it tastes like. And if you're interested, that um, website is Reese'sPuffs.com. They also have um, where you can unlock and see special dances um, of this guy, but you have to have these secret codes that come from the actual cereal boxes in order to do that. And they also have uh, advertisements as well, and you can see those on YouTube if you just search on the serial name. So this is what we see in practice, and research has indeed documented that food and beverage marketing to African Americans is oriented towards less healthful products in terms of advertising, digital marketing, store locations, and the variety of food that's available. Um, I worked on a review of research to examine this. Uh, what we did was look at whether or not African Americans are more likely to be targeted with unhealthy foods than white consumers. We conducted a systematic review of empirical research that looked at targeted food marketing to African Americans to see what types of food and beverages are they made aware of, do they have access to, and what do they cost. Over this 14-year period, our search identified only 20 articles, and although the data was limited, it was consistent. We found that promotion was dominated by low-cost, low-nutrition, energy-dense foods such as candy, soda, and snacks, and that positive nutritional messages were less frequent. And relative to predominantly white neighborhoods, predominantly black neighborhoods have fewer supermarkets and healthier food choices may be less prevalent. They also have a higher density of fast food outlets, and fast food may cost significantly more. And as we think about how we might intervene and address some of these issues in the health influence that target, might, target marketing might have on consumers, I wanted to make sure we think about some of the complexities of there, that are there. 
One is that consumers may see no problem with targeted food marketing because it may provide some benefits. It may provide safe spaces um, for people to congregate. It may bring employment to the community. Um, many of the food marketers may indeed come from the community. And then other black businesses also benefit. There's a large industry of black advertising and marketing um, organizations and also black media tends to benefit from a lot of the advertising that food and beverage marketers do. So any questions or comments? I know I breezed th through that pretty quickly. Um, Sonia, that was fabulous. That was fabulous. You breathed yeah. through it quickly. She kept in the time that I told her. It was great. <laughs> and we are going to hold the questions until we've heard from our second speaker, Kwese. Um, But please, I want to encourage people, if you have questions for Sonia or questions about target marketing in general, the techniques that are used, what we can do about it, any of these issues that Sonia has raised, please type into your Q&A box your question. We'll be collecting those so that we can have a robust discussion after our second presenter. Thank you so much, Sonia. That was just fabulous. And now I would like to invite Kwese to talk to us about what he thinks about target marketing, what's been going on in his neck of the woods around it, and what he thinks uh, people can do about it. So okay. take it away, Kwese. <laughs> okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, once again, my name is Kwese Ronald Harris, and uh, very excited about this uh, opportunity to uh, talk to you a little bit about um, how I can see uh, a transferable opportunity from one campaign to become maybe a catalyst or a, uh, a torchlight to begin to help us better organize for change as we uh, address the issues of um, high fat, sugar, salt, content, junk food, fast foods. As it's, and I see it as a believe for for me, I actually see it as a, a declaration of war because when you're talking about targeting anybody, that means you're one of two things: you're either targeting them for uh, you reaping profit, or them uh, obtaining some type of pleasure, or possibly some type of pain. And in more cases, with this junk food and fast food, it's generally some type of pain. And so. I'll begin by the first slide. It just talks about organizing for change. And the mantra you see there, speak out, take action, fight back, is something that we used in a campaign that I was a part of about, um, ooh, this 2011, I would say about maybe what, seven maybe seven years ago uh, when we went after uh, Brown and Williamson with a campaign that they were doing called Fight Cool. Uh, um, it was the, well, the, our response was called Fight Cool. Theirs was the Cool Mix campaign, which they actually targeted a segment of our community, particularly our young people, uh, with the images of hip-hop. And so um, the Adinkra symbols you see up there, I love to make this a teachable moment. Uh, the first one is G and Yame. That's the symbol that kind of looks like, uh, it may even look like uh, script writing or picture writing from uh, our brothers and sisters in the Asian rim, but it's actually a symbol from Ghana, and it means uh, G and Yame, I fear nothing except God. The other symbol in the middle, it kind of looks like uh, something's chasing one another, and it's actually two mudfish, and it's a symbol that means B and Kabi, and it speaks as something Big Mama would tell us when we were down home. If you don't have nothing nice to say, don't say nothing. You know, don't don't speak ill against other people. You know, always speak something of, uh, you know, goodwill. And the next symbol looks like four eyes, but that's actually a symbol of Mati Masi, which means I've kept what I've heard. It's a symbol of wisdom and knowledge. So there's my hopes and prayers and my intent that we walk away moving in that direction today. So let me get to the next slide. Um, and that slide, actually, um, I, I love stories, and, and, and I, Alice in Wonderland is, is a wonderful story. But there's a scene in the story when she met the Chester Cat, and most of us, uh, if we've been privileged enough to have, you know, we can reflect back to our childhood. We may have been even read that story, or you may have even seen the recent uh, depiction of it in, on the big screen, uh, not animated, but uh, with, with with actual actors. But it, it, she, the, the cat, Alice, asks one day, she says, uh, she came to a fork in the road and she saw the Chester cat in the tree and said, which road do I take? And she asks that question, and the Chester cat says uh, to her question, where do you want to go? And she implied, I, I don't know, answered Alice. And then the cat just simply said, then it doesn't matter. Well, 
I'm of the mindset that it does matter, and we need to be clear on where we're looking to go. And as Sonia spoke earlier about target marketing, um, I actually see it as a as a as a as a target. You know um, that this you know, and generally when you look at a target, there's one principal site you always focus on, and that is the center, the bullseye. And generally when you go up against these industries, they'll always tell you we're not targeting the children. We're not, you know, it's not even, we're, we're, this is for the grown people. This is for the adults. But be clear, uh, the adults, is they'll tell you it's the assumed target, and then the unintended target is the young adults. And, and on the peripheral is the collateral damage, the, our children. And that's where they, they want us to keep them there. They don't want us to put the children back in the middle. They want them to be out there on the fringes. And they're very clear. And I think Sonia shared that, and she showed it through the research and how young people are. And, and I use a, a, a thought when I talk to young people a lot of times across the country. And one thing I'm clear about working with young people, uh, young adults, is that they don't like being played. And I'm sure all of us can attest to that with our own children. You know, they, they don't don't fool me. You know, you know, give it give it to me straight. You know, uh, without a chaser, give it to me. <laughs> you know, just give it to me, and and, and we'll work it. And so um, I, I I like for young people to see that they've been that they've been pimped, that they've been punked, that they've been played, and they they've been even macked, and they're all under attack. And I want them to man up this time because there's a war going on, and the war is going on between knowledge and wisdom, and we have to get our young people to understand that, yes, they know some things, but sometimes they do some very unwise acts, and the industry plays on that. They really do. And so this is a quote from Bill Cosby because uh, I asked the question, who will you target? And Bill said this, and he says, I don't know the key to success, but the key to failure is trying to please everybody. Industries are very clear on that. They're not trying to please everybody. They are going for a, a, a certain designated uh, rim of the community, uh, be it if it's a cultural group, if it's an age group, uh, a gender group, you name it. They're clear on what, who's the target. And when the target has been acquired, missiles away. And so the team market is the target when you really begin to talk about this fast food and junk food um, because why? Young people have large amounts of disposable income. Um, I wish somebody give me the insight on how they acquire it, but every time I look up, they're buying something. And so teens are far more likely to be influenced by promotional pieces, particularly in convenience stores. And that's where we see a lot of the assaults taking place in the, the neighborhood, mini marks and, you know, service stations, and that's just a reality. But then um, Sonia kind of gave uh, – uh, an idea of a profile of that population, and, and, and these are some ones that I actually looked at about young people. What do they appreciate? They appreciate speed. We, we've all seen it. They live for the moment. Give it to me right now. You know, uh, individuality, you know, they, they, it's essential that they retain their individuality within a group environment and have the freedom to express themselves. That's the uniqueness of hip-hop, and you'll see in further slides how hip hop came under attack by a particular industry the tobacco industry and you'll see the how that's transferable even across the food spectrum because they're under assault right now i think sonia just showed us that with the uh the Reese puff uh screen uh scene that was on the uh on the uh, webinar trend setting recognizing the power of being first they constantly seek opportunities for newness technology our children are the ones we've been waiting on. They're so technically savvy; it's 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 mind-boggling. I mean, they have they they are very very uh, high tech, and and if they're in the cloud, then we need to get up in the clouds with them, and and be there to let them know that they need to keep their feet on the ground and and not so much getting so lost in the technology, but get back into high touch. Because I'm under the mindset that when you're in high touch, they can't touch you. <laughs> uh, entertainment. Part of the, you know, that's the whole notion of, you know, it's got to be engaging, and, and the industry plays on all of that. And so as we was looking at the tobacco fights, we saw spare no expense, and you see that happening now even in the food, the food wars that are going on. Everybody's, you know, it's not, I don't know a fast food restaurant that doesn't have a dollar menu, okay? But that's just a means to draw you in because they'll spend that advertising dollar of $26 million a day in the tobacco industry, but what do they make? It's, 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 it's staggering. 
so they don't mind investing it. This is what I was speaking about earlier when I spoke about the Cool Mix campaign. Here you clearly see uh, a certain aspect of youth culture under assault. I don't know about anybody else on the call, any of the other attendees, but I've never saw the Marlboro Man on a pack of cigarettes. I, I never saw that. And so when I saw this, and, and some of my other colleagues, and some of them may even be on the phone today, uh, we began to uh, you know, alarm and arm the young people with the corrected information on how to speak truth to power against this. And what was interesting, um, these four packs of cigarettes could be placed together, and as you see down in the lower right-hand corner, it actually formed a mural of hip-hop culture. It showed the, the DJ mixing. It showed the MC rapping. It showed the B-boys breaking. It showed the, 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 black, the, the taggers, the, the graffiti artists. All of this was because why, as Sonia clearly showed us early in her slides, they study you. They watch you. And so, again, when we shut down that campaign, what did they come out with? They still kept the colors. They still kept the vibrantness of it. They just removed the human aspect of it, but still... These are things that attract young people. If it's colorful, if it's bright, if it's catchy, it's sassy, I want to check it out. And so, again, this is the outcome from that, this slide here that you see. Um, I like to think that this is our community right now because it's plastered with these kind of images everywhere. The only thing I would change on this slide is the statement on the young people's shirt, the future. They're not our future. They're actually our present. And if we're going to change anything, particularly with these food wars that are going on, we're going to have to you know, realize that there's a present and clear danger lurking in our community. And sometimes it comes dressed as a clown. And sometimes it comes dressed as a, a colonel. Sometimes it even comes as a, as, as a piece of man. But at the end of the day, we need to let our young people know that it's hard to hit a moving target. And so they're in the crosshairs. This is the crosshairs of, of, of corporations. And, and we have to be clear about what we're talking about here. This is not just somebody, you know, sitting in a, in a restaurant flipping burgers and, you know, making, uh, you know, fish fillet sandwiches. These are individuals sitting in rooms with, you know, uh, nice suits, you know, uh, glass windows looking out over, you know, a huge avenue who are literally looking at your community as fertile ground, riping for the taking. And so as we begin to move beyond the junk food, fast food, and the, and the culture of it, we have to be clear with our young people, and particularly, you know, advocates that are working with them, that what we eat every day affects us physically, either promoting or degrading our health and well-being. You know, we see young people going to school every morning with, with flaming hots and some uh, dye-colored juice drink. And then we wonder why, when they get to class, they're not performing at their optimum capacity. Well, they're in a drug-induced psychosis at that moment in the classroom. And so, no, teacher can't penetrate the heart or the brain at that time. We might even have to put them on life support, even while they're in the classrooms, because these are the these are forms, as far as I'm concerned, junk foods are nothing but drugs. I mean, when you down at the bottom, you see it says junkie, and that's not a disrespect to anybody, but at the end of the day, that's what you become. And so the nutrition values need to be looked at, begin to talk about more healthy food choices. Food preparations is very, very clear. I, I watched a video early today of this gentleman. Uh, I think his name is Jamie Oliver, and he's, he's this whole thing. He's one of the TED people, and he talked about teaching our children how to eat, you know, how to eat to live, you know, food that, 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 that stimulates them. And so what does that bring about options to change the patterns of disease and death surrounding the foods we eat. Let me keep going. Uh, this is where I really I want to show you uh, or, or introduce to you how we began to speak out, take action, and fight back. And it was really to overcome our fear because sometimes people in communities, when they see these, uh, you know, imagine here you are looking at McDonald's and it says we feed 45 billion people. That's almost the population of the country of Spain. That's like we're gonna go up against that, yeah, well, you know, uh not to do something is not to do the you know not to do something is to do nothing that you can do, and so we communicate our message, we get what we want, and then we get them to be accountable and this was a 
this slide you see here is, is, is kind of a formula that I like to think that we were successful in waging the fight against the cool mix campaign is that at the top it was grassroots. Nothing that you're looking to do as it relates to uh, improving the, 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 the health and wellness of our community, because that's what we're really talking about when we're talking about this junk food and fast foods and these food deserts. We're talking about bringing about well-being that's back to our communities. It's not going to happen if the grassroots are not involved in it. And I mean in a genuine, authentic kind of way. Not just to say we went to a community, we spoke to some uh, self-appointed leaders. Sometimes, you know, you got to go beyond what's on the surface and go down to the real roots. And the real roots aren't individuals that you normally, they're not your garden variety types. They're the folks who generally, you, they're not going to show up to a meeting. But they have, they have vested interest, sweat equity in that community, and they want to see a difference. How do you access them? You find people, you know, like myself, like Sonia, you know, and others around the country, because one thing I'm excited about is that we got over 102 people on this phone today. That means 102 individuals are going to get infected with, with right information, uh, new ideas, new thoughts, new, you know, uh, a paradigm shift. And who knows, we're going to go out and inoculate the rest of our communities. But we went from grassroots to litigation. What is litigation? I, I challenge everyone on this phone, if you don't know your state's attorney general, get to know them because that is the chief litigator for any state. Anything that you want to move as it relates to litigation, that means bringing lawsuits, yeah, you know, class action suits, you want to have that person in your camp. Why? Because when they swing their stick, it generally knocks the ball out of the park, particularly when they hear from the the the, the hearts and souls and the and, and the minds of the individuals who are the most affected by the situation. And then we move across to legislation because once we can then begin to talk about policy and creating laws that have to be enacted, have to be practiced, have to be enforced, then we see spirit in action because all of this is driven by spirit. What has been done? This shows you part of that whole notion of legislation and litigation. This is at a center I used to work with in the Chicago area where we came together, and we literally told Brown and Williamson, if you don't leave the babies alone, you're going to have problems with us. And these are some of those individuals that you see listed there, um, Attorney General Lisa Madigan, now the uh, Governor Pat Quinn, and Secretary of State, of State of Illinois. And the beautiful thing about that, in my state, you got the same reflective uh, reflection in your state, and so you 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 get access to them. You get to you know take your questions and your concerns to them. Again, grassroots. These are young people that we we came together to address this issue. And how did we do it? We spoke out. We took action. We fought back. And speaking out. What does that mean? What does that you know? What what does that really? host a series of we're watching you sessions, watching you, meaning that we're letting the corporations, we're letting the restaurants and the fast food industry and the, the dis, dis, distribution companies that we're watching you. You know, we're going to invite young people to learn more about the campaign, to learn more about the presence of fast food and junk food in their community. Imagine having Sonia come to your community. And this is what I, I'm so excited about, that we have the we, we, we have the research we have the, 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 the individuals that are taking it to the street, and, and here we are now having a dialogue. Imagine if that happens in everybody's community, where you get a Sonia coming to, you know, drop that knowledge that she laid out about research. I mean, that's a missing piece in most grassroots movement that we, you know, we, we, we have the passion, but do we have the right information? And so that's what the watching you sessions are about. Then you listen to the participants and you hear their thoughts about fast food and junk foods, the industry campaigns, and how they affect their communities. Um, and so what has been done? Again, here's um, well one of my good uh, friends and uh, fellow colleagues, McConney Timber Nixon, in Chicago doing a drop squad training. Drop squad was an acronym. Drop meant doing right by our people. Okay, and it was just a training that we did in Chicago where we were arming individuals with the right information on how to address this social issue uh, or this issue. And one of the things that we did I thought that was unique is that we coined it in the phrase of social justice and environmental racism. 
See, that's another piece is how do you put it in a language that you're not going to get any pushback from uh, righteous individuals? Because that says, wait a minute, they're being targeted on that level? We need to man up, you know, stand up and uh, get up and go fight with them. And so, again, these were other, you know, again, organizing in the community. Take action. Again, what did we do? We're watching you. These were advocacy training series on how to gather intelligence. You know, you have to lay this out as if it's a military campaign. Go gather the intelligence. Survey, print, electronic media. I like the piece that Sonia just showed, with again, with, you know, that cloud, you know, uh, um, aspect of technology today is where our young people are at. They're on the viral uh, networks. They're on the social marketing sites. Don't think for one minute those industries aren't there, too. And so the media advocacy piece, talking to the media, it's not so much we as advocates going to talk to the media, but we prepare young people to articulate the message, and then we dare someone to tell them no. Because then you're telling us then that you're not really in the best interest of the present or future of our young people's lives. Then we, we move to local media, get your voices heard, write uh, editorials, op-ed pieces, postcards, send messages to the food and beverage industry retailers and other targets. I remember one time during the Cool Mix fight, we used to hold rip-out parties, and the rip-out parties were simply parties where everybody came to, but to get in the door, you had to bring a magazine. And the, what we would do is rip out all of the ads that advertised alcohol and tobacco. So imagine if we ripped out all the ads that had the fast food chains and the junk foods in them, and then we wrote letters to that particular publication. I love your articles. I love your stories. But I got an issue with these people, ad, you know, having advertising space in your in your uh, publication. Uh, what has been done again? These are some of the cultural warriors, one of my very good friends who's now on the other side, Brother Damu Smith. I always want to pay homage to him because he was someone who spoke truth to power, and Brother James Muhammad and some others. Again, this is the fighting back again. This is us where we created spoofs, and we showed up at the venues, wherever those venues were at. So this is some direct action. Yes, you may have to show up at a neighborhood fast food restaurant and, and create uh, a, 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 a presence of civil obedience or disobedience, however they want to phrase it. But you're being obedient because you know this is destroying your people. Fight back. Launch. And this is where I really love is when you launch counter-marketing campaigns. See, the reality is they're going to say what they're going to say. They're going to do what they want to do. But at the end of the day, we have to create these counter-marketings. And I want to move real fast because I know time is of the essence. This is a counter-marketing campaign that you take a look at right now. And you can clearly see that it's going up against menthol cigarettes. Why? Because mentholated cigarettes are one of the largest selling menthol, you know, brand of cigarettes in the African-American community as well as Latino community. So clearly our rehearsals become other folks' commercials. They see our hip, they get our hop, and next thing you know, we're not on top. We're at someone's bottom rung of the ladder. But this was a direct response to cool cigarettes where we said, don't be fooled. Again, there's one where it actually sees the cigarette as a loaded gun, a shot right to the head. And a self-inflicted gunshot wound means suicide or, you know, you, you were just w willing to end your own life. And I can't imagine no one paying somebody to destroy my life. And again, here's our communities again, the Latino community, African-American community. These kind of ads are plastered all over our communities. They're under siege. Our, just like our community are littered with these advertisements, our communities are also under siege by these other uh, entities, restaurants. Uh, this is another spoof that we did against uh, Miller's uh, Beer. You know, we actually call it killer because it, it kills. I mean, you know, young people are being drafted, they're young minds, to die for the cause of this industry, and we're, we're not with that. These were spoofs that some of our young people actually created. And that's one of the beautiful things about getting young people involved in this fight. They are so creative. They, they they just come up with the, the right language, the right imagery. Why? Because it speaks to them. And that's where we need to, you know, be, be open and receptive to. Now, this, clearly, you can see what this ad is saying. I let it speak for itself. But you see that on one side is Burger King. On the other side is uh, Royal Blunts, Wet Mango. The phallic symbols are there. I mean, J. Diego Hoover said this, and by no means I'm, I'm a fan of his, but he said these words, a conspiracy so monstrous that the individuals cannot believe it exists. 
it's the same thing with with these other industries. You know, I'm not a prude or nothing, and, and people can, you know, your sexual behavior, that's your call. But this is being targeted to our young people. And clearly, it's it's an alarm at the gate. And so what can we do now as we get ready to bring it down? Intelligence gathering. We we got to do that. Environmental scans of our communities. Youth leadership development. I can't state that enough. We Our legs are getting uh, weary. Our arms are getting tired. It's not that we're out of the game. It's just that it's time to pass it on to someone else now. And so we have to develop these constituencies of youth leaders. Build a community legislative agenda. Promote village circle talks. I qualify that by just saying I don't believe in town hall meetings. Uh, for me, as a as a descendant of African people, whenever there was town hall meetings, generally I was either being sold or they were preparing to uh, take my life. And so I flipped that language in my community, and I call them village circle talks. Because in a village, I feel safe. I know who my village uh, uh, residents are because I've taken time to know them. We sit in a circle, and that means we've mutually agreed to to join together. And in, 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 um, we don't do a thing about talks as much as it is about it is about talking, not debating and getting into you know rants and raves, and definitely media advocacy training. That's that's critical. What did we learn from all of this that we did? We proved that our different organizations, what they've been saying all along, communities of color required a different approach. Messaging is very important. Grassroots activity is the most effective to be heard. And do not settle. There is no room for compromise. So I say to you, imagination. What you imagine will lead a nation. Thus, imagination is vital to saving our children. United we stand, united we fall. No division among us. It can't be that united we stand, divided we fall. That's ain't going to be no divisions. That means nobody goes to the back room and make a deal and get a uh, happy meal. It's not. That's not what it's about at all. It's about us standing together. And then it's easy, though. This is simple work. This is not as hard as it may seem for those that have never done it. Once you get in it, make the calls. That, become the 1-800 number operator's worst nightmare at a particular company's 1-800 call-in number. Speak out, face-to-face meetings, write, and get the media involved. And mess- your messages has to be for everyone. Target urban youth that is manipulating our culture. And who's next? Because if it's us today, it's going to be somebody else tomorrow. And so in a unified voice, uh, and, and where it says intergenerational, I would only add that that should also say multi culture, multi-faceted intergenerational groups working together. Because when spider webs unite, they can tie up a lion. And we have to be clear on who the lions are. And with that, let's think critically, let's reflect deeply, and let's act creatively. And... Remember, their eyes are upon us. Our children are watching us every single day. And so when a man starts out to build a world, he starts first with himself. When then the mind starts seeking a way, then the hand seeks other hands to help. Thus the dream becomes not just one man's dream, but a community's dream. Not my world alone, but your world and my world, belonging to all the hands that build. That's the honor, the spiritual memory of Langston Hughes, who always said we must do it all together. You have the power, so be powerful. We have the power. And with that, thanks. Any questions? <laughs> Crazy. Thank you. That was fantastic, <laughs> incredible. The work is amazing. And the inspiration, I think, is felt by all of our attendees. We do have a couple questions. Sure. If we don't get to all the questions during the Q&A session, we'll try to get back to you all as the webinar ends. Um, there if on the bottom of the attendees list that you all see where it says attendees, you'll see a little hand. And if you click that hand, that allows you to raise your hand. And we, I believe, can unmute you. We're going to give that a try. And I know, I think it's uh, Tawab. I um, hope I don't uh, butcher your last name here. Saljuki, I know you have a question. I'm sorry if I didn't say your name properly. Um, go ahead and ask. I believe you're unmuted. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question was related to funding, and uh, I have uh, been to many countries, and uh, everywhere it is the government who is paying for the counter campaigns, and it's a very minimal amount of money, which is uh, nothing in comparison to the amount of money that has been invested by 
uh, big corporations to uh, promote their products. Uh, so uh, where we can find money to, to, to fund these uh, counter-marketing campaigns? Thank you. Uh, can, can we speak? Yeah, go right yeah. ahead. What, what, what I would say to that is, you know, I'll give you an example. When we started the Cool Mix campaign, we didn't have any money neither. But we did have something that money couldn't buy, and that was our passion and our spirit that we knew something was wrong. And by us doing that, we, we created this atmosphere where people just came and gave of themselves. You know, they just gave. You know, it wasn't always a monetary piece. If we wait for the money to come, we'll never get it done. I, I And I don't want to sound, you know, like what you're saying is not important. It's very important. That nothing is ever free. Everything comes with a price. But in this age of technology, this age of viral networking, we can get messages out via YouTube. We can get messages out through blogging. We can get messages out through uh, e-blasting. This is where you partner with groups like the community creating healthy environments, the BMSG, you know, the media group that's hosting the group right now. And, and, and trust me, what came out of the Cool Mix campaign is, though, even though we didn't go in looking for any money, because we were successful in bringing Brown and Williamson down, resources then came to the community. So sometimes you have to do the work on the front end so that you can get resources on the back end. So that's just part of the, the righteousness of the struggle in doing the work. And this is an issue that at Berkeley Media Studies Group we're very interested in. So people who are interested in working on it with us, we're happy to connect with you and also to connect you with communities creating healthy environments and the Praxis Project. Our, our next question is from Amy Nelson. Amy, we're going to unmute you here, and then you can ask your question. Go right ahead. Hi. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, thank you to both speakers. That was really helpful and informative. And especially um, a lot of the samples of uh, campaigns that have been done to counteract all of this targeted marketing. My question is specifically around the counter-marketing spoofs that you were talking about. Um, I live in California and work for a government agency, and it is um, part of the California network that no state dollars can be used for any campaign or ad that disparages a food product. So using a counter-marketing spoof, basically telling people not to eat or drink specific foods is not something that we can do. And I was wondering if uh, either of you have come across that and how you would address that and what you would think about other, um, other ways that you could do marketing campaigns, specifically printed um, that would be just as useful. Thanks for your question, Amy. Um, Sonia or Kweze, do either of you have a thought about that particular constraint? Well, I think there's one. I don't not about that particular constraint, but I think the flip side of what we've been talking about is also campaigns to get companies to promote healthier foods mm -hmm. because right. they're for all of the media that run these different advertisements and promotions for all the stores that are there, if we say you need to take this away, then it has to be replaced with something. And yeah. so finding ways to get support for the products, and that's one of the issues that always comes up is that companies will say, well, people aren't buying these healthier products. So, you know, trying to have that as a strategy as well in addition to taking away some things as having something to replace it with because the black newspapers, radio stations, Hispanic TV shows, et cetera, still are going to need advertising dollars. Right, and there's not a whole, like, carrot media campaign going on out there that's going to help <laughs> pay for those TV ads. <laughs> right. right. That's right. Thanks, Which, Amy. Oh, go ahead. Question. You know, I was going to say, you know, just the other day there was a uh, – a, a research piece that showed where between Latinos and African Americans, our usage of um, of uh, cyberspace, if I could use that as the, the word, the internet and uh, uh, smartphones and the, the level of technology, this is where we we this is where that whole notion of preparing young people to become leaders or or youth advocates is around media could be a very um, 
hidden jewel because you you bring someone in to enlighten them and give them the the rim to create creative expressions. Well, see, once young people create it, that's you know, and I understand your role your role, Amy, as being a, a you know working for a state entity. This is where you know as you working for a state entity, but there are other people who don't work for the state entity. And if they get the right information, get the opportunity to learn how to see, this is with them them bridging with uh, BMM is a wonderful thing because that's a teachable moment. This is a media company that can come in and do technical assistance along with like the Praxis Project, the community creating healthy environments to begin to teach young people how to craft those kind of messages. And again, it doesn't always have to, the spoofs were created because at that time we wanted to, we wanted to take what the, the negative was and show them clearly what it was being done to you because the, the way they were trying to display it was always as it was positive, you know, like fresh on the scene. I actually saw one of Sonia's ads on the McDonald's that actually looked at like a Newport cigarette ad that was on her ads today. I say, man, these folks study each other. So I think we have time just for one more question. Um, Joyce, we're going to unmute you and then let you ask the question, and then I'm hoping we'll have a minute or two to hear from um, Makani. But Makani, you'll need to raise your hand for us to unmute you if you're um, still on the line. Joyce, go ahead. Hi. First of all, I'd like to say that I came in like in the middle of Sonia's, but uh, for the last presentation, I thought it's wonderful. I saw us the symbols and everything, and I was thought I was looking at my own work. <laughs> um, but my question is, uh, uh, are you finding that uh, while you're going around the country with this information that uh, uh, you're, you have examples or, um, you know, of your presentation and things like that, or will we have access to it so that we could share in our communities that's that's my question for both of you. Um, Joyce, I'm going to take the prerogative and answer for both of them and say, yes, we're going to find a way to get this information available to people. We've been recording the webinar, and we're not sure yet um, exactly where it's going to appear, but it will um, send us in a Q, uh, in the Q&A box, your email will be sure to let you know, but we'll try to get in touch with everybody and send out a notice about where the webinar will be available so everybody can see everything. Thank you. It's wonderful presentation. Thank you Thank so much. You. Thank Thanks, you. Joyce. And Makani, you've got the, the last couple minutes to give us your thoughts about all of this. And I won't even take that long. <laughs> so one, I want to um, thank um, Berkeley Media Studies Group and Quasi and Sonia for out, just outstanding presentations and just really, uh, again, affirm BMSG's role in saying, look, we've got to sit down and figure out how to how to really help catalyze this movement. All of us are veterans of many of these wars, and we know this is bad. In fact, we are in the process of working on a website that's really focused on chicken targeting because we think it's also a really bad issue if you look at some of those things, and we'll be talking with you more about that. And just the bottom line is, is that for everyone on the call and beyond, um, if this is going to stop, we're going to have to organize a movement. It's not going to be enough to do these interventions with our clients and our populations. We're going to have to organize to hold the industry accountable and to let them know that this kind of predatory marketing just cannot take place. So, again, I just want to thank everyone for pulling this together, and I look forward to working with each and every one of you on moving this forward to make this a real movement with national implications to really change the face of our communities and Makani. our waistlines. And our waistlines. <laughs> <laughs> Makani, thank you so much. Thanks to the Praxis Project for uh, its leadership with CCHE and communities um, creating healthy environments. Thank you so much to Sonia Greer of American University and Kweze Harris of Capra. We're so I'm delighted that we could have everybody talking about this all together, and the promise I'll make to everyone is that this was the first webinar on target marketing. There will be more. We'll keep talking about this, and we'll find ways together to do something about it. Thank you all very much for joining us today, and this brings us to our conclusion. It's, it's been a pleasure, and we hope to see you all in this way very soon. <laughs>